Hi, welcome back to the Future Security Forum. Uh, this is our last panel for the day. It's, it's entitled, As the Coronavirus Spreads, What are the Implications for the U.S. and the World? It will be moderated by Peter Bergen. He's Vice President of New America, CNN National Security Analyst, Professor of Practice at Arizona State University, where he co-directs the Center on the Future of War. He's the author of many books, three of which were New York Times bestsellers, as well as a number of documentaries based on his books and Several have been nominated for Emmys and won, won an Emmy for Best Documentary. So uh, thanks so much, and I'll turn this over to Peter. Well, thanks, Daniel. So um, a very timely panel, unfortunately. Uh, as the coronavirus spreads, what does it mean for the United States and the world? We now have 200,000 Americans dead. Uh, hardly predictable, uh, or perhaps all too predictable, depending on your perspective. Uh, we have a, a, a wonderful a group of panelists to discuss this, uh, Dr. Helene Gale, who is the chairman of New America, uh, also the, the co-chair of the National Academy of Sciences uh, Committee on how to more equitably uh, distribute uh, potential vaccine or vaccines. Um, and uh, Dr. Gale spent uh, more than two, decade, two decades at CDC working on HIV AIDS, so brings a lot of uh, experience uh, to this issue. We also have Dr. Daniela Blamas, who is uh, at Brigham Young as a critical care doctor. She's a frequent contributor about her work uh, to the New York Times and the Washington Post. Uh, she's also uh, on the faculty of Harvard Medical School. And we have Dr. George Post, who is a professor at Arizona State. He's a virologist uh, who's had a long career in public health uh, and, and uh, expertise in the issues relating uh, two viruses. And finally, Dr. Mike Osterholm, who joins us from the University of Minnesota, who is uh, one of the nation's uh, leading infectious disease specialists. Um, and um, so I'll begin uh, with Dr. Gale. Uh, I'm going to basically ask everybody the same question, which we could just spend the whole hour on, which is, where are we? How do we get here? Where are we going? And what do we do? So uh, very easy questions. I'll start with you, Dr. Gale. Uh, when uh, some prize or you know uh, something, I, and I think one of the things that has been a hallmark of this is that as soon as you think you know something, something else happens, and this has been you know, such a unprecedented and um, uh, clearly something that we were unprepared for. And um, that said, you know, we've always known that something like this could occur, uh, not only could it occur, but what would, would occur and that we should have been better prepared for it. And I think, you know, that's the big lesson is that, you know, although these uh, situations are incredible and catastrophic, uh, we could do much more to be prepared and could have been much better prepared, particularly had we had a, the right kind of national leadership um, and coordination um, in place. Uh, so, you know, one, um, we can always be better prepared. Two, you know, I think we're still at the beginning of this. You know, you, you talked about the numbers, um, you know, we're not seeing the kind of slowing down globally that would convince us that we're really at the tail end of this versus you know, continuing to experience growth in uh, infection rates and, and in death and the um, corollary economic consequences. And so you know, we're still um, in the, I don't know if we'd say early days, but we're clearly not at the end of this. And you know, I guess I would just finally say you know, that um, there's already a lot that we could do. We know the ways in which we can protect ourselves. Um, unfortunately, um, there's been so much confusion around what works and what doesn't work that we're not, uh, and not having a consistent overall message around this, that we're not putting in place as aggressively the things that we know can make a difference like mask wearing, social distancing, um, hygiene, et cetera. And so I think there, that while we are all looking forward to the, to the day when there will be a vaccine, when we have more 
um, testing in place, et cetera, I think we shouldn't forget that there's a lot that we could be doing today that could make a huge difference. And, you know, many people on here have run some of the numbers that um, show us what we could do if we were, in fact, putting in place the things that we already know work. Hello, Dr. Post. Okay. Hi, Peter. Yeah. No, I, I think clearly, as Dr. Gale outlined, it's a complex, multi dimensional failure, both historically and currently. Historically, we've got here on the basis of multiple decades of neglect, the stark failures which have been revealed in all aspects of our current capabilities have been outlined in numerous reports which sit uh, and gather dust on shelves. Uh, as Mike Osterholm knows, a Defense Science Board study which I chaired back 25 years ago is essentially a blueprint for the myriad deficiencies that we're seeing now. So I think in part it's an out of sight, out of mind problem, which is very much a curse of contemporary society anyway, and you, there's only an immediate reactive rather than a proactive uh, uh, posture, and we have a sort of reflex episodic response when something occurs, whether it be Ebola or Zika or Chikungunya, whatever is the culprit of the moment, uh, obviously we've not encountered anything on the scale of COVID-19 and all of the pandemic preparedness, as, you're, as everyone is aware, was primarily directed towards uh, influenza. Uh, but even if we had had the appropriate infrastructure in place to deal with influenza, we would of course be far better prepared to deal with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, as so, I suppose both historically and in the current situation, the watchword would be consistent inconsistency. Uh, and uh, it's certainly been compounded by uh, quite substantial uh, underinvestment long term, but now complicated, of course, by uh, an unwillingness of society to either take this seriously. Uh, uh, the consistent inconsistency in messaging that we've spoken about from, both from the White House, uh, multiple public agencies and the media, we're now left with a situation where probably the most corrosive element beyond political divisiveness uh, in Congress is the issue of the impact on public trust. And I think we're going to see that played out most importantly as and when we get a vaccine as to what will be the level of uptake of that vaccine. Dr. Lamas, you're on the front lines of this. Um, I mean, are we are we prepared for uh, what Dr. Rose to Holmes has said uh, publicly? You know, we're in the second inning of a nine inning game. I don't know if he's changed his view since he last said that publicly. But I mean, what does this fall? What does this winter look like for you on the front lines? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the question of whether we're we're prepared, um, we're more knowledgeable now than we were uh, in March. Um, in terms of many things, sort of. Just small things and and large you know we uh we at least are knowledgeable about the uh impact of wearing masks um i think it is extremely worrisome and obviously uh extraordinarily sort of sort of sad and frustrating that we uh continue to fail to do so um, in a sustained fashion um you know within the hospital uh we are better at managing patients with uh, covid 19 and severe covid 19 pneumonia that being said um because of our lack of preparation and sort of the way uh, the response and sort of broader clinical trials work um, in this country, there are many answers that we don't have that that we could have had. You know, we we don't and likely won't have an answer to whether convalescent plasma is useful. Um, we do understand the benefit of Decadron. We have thought a lot about early intubation versus being able to wait a little bit longer. These are things that will be different. Um, uh, as patients continue to come through um, with coronavirus and if there is a, a broader surge. Uh, you know, that being said, I think there have been there have been opportunities to be able to uh, really answer, ask and answer sort of in a systematic fashion questions about what works and how to benefit patients that we don't have the answers to. Um, you know, I think there was a, a huge uh, emphasis initially on ventilators. 
Um, that emphasis was important, but but really, I think the emphasis should have been on on things like like masking um, instead of you know really pushing this ventilator question. So so there are things that will be different the second time around um, if and and when that comes. Um, uh, but I think that there are also ways in which we could have been better prepared than than we are now. Uh, when you've done sort of back of the envelope math. Um, using certain kind of common assumptions, You're, you've come said that we're probably looking at 800,000 deaths, uh, given the kind of, uh, is that kind of where you still are? And kind of what should we be doing, given what our, your other panelists, our other panelists have said so far? For me, I didn't quite hear that. Was that for me? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, Dr. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter. Well, first of all, thank you for having me, and it's great to be with this august uh, group of, of experts here. Uh, at this point, uh, I think that the number of 800,000 hopefully will be high. Uh, and I think part of that, as you just heard, has been some dramatic improvement uh, with regard to treatment and the fact that we've seen mortality rates drop by almost uh, a fourth uh, in terms of what they were in the early days of the April house on fire in places like New York, Lombardy, region of Italy, and so forth. And so we've done much better that way. I think what people don't yet understand is, and you had cited me earlier being in the third inning, I think maybe fourth or fifth, but uh, let me just say there's a lot left to go. We don't, I don't think, quite get this yet. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that this virus is a real challenge in terms of something as simple and yet as every bit as critical as durable immunity. We're not quite sure yet just how much vaccines can or will protect for the long term. Uh, we don't know how much uh, immunity we're going to actually really realize as a result of natural infection. Uh, we're already seeing breakthrough cases where we happen to have the isolates from the first infection and the second infection, or at least the genetic uh, material, to be able to determine these were two, truly two different infections. And the fact that we even have eight of those already given the likelihood of having one patient with a viral isolate, let alone two, uh, it says that this is a much more common event. And we recognize with our work with SARS and MERS that this was likely to be a challenge. So we've got more curveballs to go. And I guess I would say the one thing that I find deeply uh, challenging with this is still what I would call a, a, a unwillingness uh, to basically uh, think about this uh, in a way that is different than past pandemic. We need really to be, uh, our creative imagination needs to come to play here. Because I think that uh, uh, we could be dealing with a, a pandemic for of like this for many, many more years to come. Not saying it's gonna be exactly the same as today, but uh, this virus isn't gonna go away soon. Dr. Gale, you're working on kind of uh, the, the Committee at National Academy of Sciences that's trying to find a way to more equitably um, distribute vaccine or vaccines. To the extent that you can talk about uh, your work publicly, um, how do you do that? Yeah, thanks. And, and um, the report will be out in October and we were asked, we had a pretty tight deadline because, you know, as everybody knows, there's a pretty uh, brisk uh, effort to try to bring uh, vaccines online and to try to have a vaccine available perhaps by as early as the end of this year, early next year. Um, and that um, it was pretty clear that there will in the beginning not be enough vaccine for everybody. And so there needed to be some way of thinking about how would you allocate this and and what would go into thinking about um, an allocation framework that was in fact equitable and took into consideration the populations that have been most hard hit, most vulnerable uh, populations who uh, already had faced health inequities, et cetera, and, and looking at a way of thinking about this. And so, you know, what we tried to do, and as many people know, the National Academy do a lot of different kinds of studies and always bring together a wide range of people with different expertise. So we had demographers, we had economists, we had lawyers, we had epidemiologists, virologists, et cetera, uh, all coming together to weigh in on these issues. And what we tried to do was to come up with first a, a principle of kind of uh, uh, ethical foundational principles 
based on this particular um, ep epidemic and what were the things uh, around, you know, maximizing benefits, fairness, uh, equal regard for life, et cetera. So we came up with a range of kind of guiding principles and then developed an allocation framework based on risk, both risk of getting the infection, risk of getting severe disease and mortality, and then risk of having a negative impact on society. Because we know that, you know, while this is a public health crisis, it has also had huge economic and social implications as well. And so we put all of those things together and came up with four different phases for allocation. And again, with the idea that ultimately when there's enough vaccine, you know, everybody should uh, get it, but that in the early phases, we had to make some hard decisions uh, of who would be in that first phase. Um, and, you know, I won't go into, you know, all of it in great detail, but it does look at, um, you know, putting in the very first phase, for instance, healthcare workers, because we know that healthcare workers both, um, e you know, even um, though there is more protective equipment now, still are putting themselves at, at risk in doing their jobs. And that if the healthcare system, um, you know, crumbled, we wouldn't have people around to take care of those who are sick. So, you know, we made decisions like that. Um, but even within healthcare workers, you know, it wasn't, this is all going to doctors and nurses. You know, there's a whole range of people, you know, including those who take, who do home care or uh, people who take care of uh, uh, people in, in nursing home facilities. Oftentimes, those are women, often women of color. So we weren't looking at, you know, only those who, you know, had the high status jobs, but looking at people who were at greatest risk. And then we went on to, to look at um, older adults, you know, who we know have also um, had most of the severe illness and death, uh, as well as people who live in congregate settings who are at great risk, et cetera. So anyway, without going into all of the four phases, we really tried to take into consideration, you know, who's at greatest risk, who's at greatest risk of getting the infection, greatest risk of dying, and greatest risk of having severe consequences for the society. Dr. Post, um, you know, obviously, if we had better diagnosis, uh, faster diagnosis, wider diagnosis, um, some of these issues would be ameliorated. So what is, I mean, what what can be done about that? Well, again, I, it comes, I've long argued and sadly confirmed by events in the current pandemic that uh, I view diagnostics as the most neglected component, the true orphan in the myriad patterns of neglect across the entire bio-preparedness spectrum. So if you could indulge me in a little bit of alliteration, I think there are six S's here. The first is situational awareness, real-time situation awareness, because without that, you're flying blind. And unless we understand the prevalence of the beast, its patterns of spread, uh, we, are, we are simply flying blind. It even is even uh, more proactive than that. The second S would be surveillance, global biosurveillance. What is the likely threat spectrum? What is likely to be coming at us? What is the most likely zoonotic uh, uh, opportunity? Uh, the third S would be speed, that once the beast is in our midst or is suspected, we need to be able to mobilize rapidly. And I think what we've seen is an abject failure of the CDC, uh, both as a combination of technical incompetence as well as hubris an arrogance to belief that they could produce a superior test. We lost an entire month uh, during, during that period. Uh, that notwithstanding, the fourth S will be scale. Even if you've got a robust and reproducible test, you've got to have this produced at scale. And the planning must be in place for the infrastructure, not only to manufacture at scale, but to distribute at scale across a network of centralized mega laboratories capable of very high throughput and also distributed point of care and point of need uh, uh, diagnostics. The, challenge, the logistical challenges are daunting. You'll see various estimates, but let's say uh, a target of 6 million tests per day is probably gonna be needed to guide us through the upcoming fall uh, and winter uh, session. Uh, the CDC, in addition to its initial ineptitude, 
should have been far more proactive in engaging the private sector. And there's a critical lesson here, not just for diagnostics, for therapeutics, PPEs, wherever you look in the preparedness equation, US government agencies have been negligent in not engaging the public sector in a suitably proactive way for rapid mobilization. The fifth S would be standards. Unless you've got stringent regulatory oversight of test performance, and once again now, another government agency, the FDA, dropped the ball by offering multiple emergency use authorizations without adequate scrutiny. As a consequence, it became a wild west of testing with regard to what are the limits of de uh, detecting a uh, floodgate of tests of dubious va uh, value and widely varying accuracy. And there are different parameters for centralized lab tests versus point of care, but we still haven't really got our hands around that. And hopefully the new NIH RADEX initiative uh, will deal with that. The last element is, uh, with apologies for the alliteration, is symptoms, uh, systems. Diagnostics are but one part of a very complex integrated matrix that must be mobilized in a, in a pandemic. Interagency coordination is fundamental in that. And once again, pointed out in multiple prior reports, it is literally non-existent, notwithstanding any additional uh, complexities which have been created by the intrusion of the political apparatus into this. We have unclear accountabilities and decision authorities. And in short, uh, these uh, problems not only uh, pervade all elements of the domestic response, we need far, far better international coordination, not just of diagnostics, but in uh, taking a systems-based systems approach. Thank you. Doc, Dr. Osterholm, um, and, and anybody else who also wants to jump in, I mean, so the CDC just last night kind of took off uh, this guidance about aer aerosolized transmission, uh, which is you know, a widely recognized scientific fact at this point. In fact, it seems to be the most important fact about this virus. So, I mean, what the hell is happening with the CDC? And then, and, and also uh, you, uh, earlier, uh, Dr. Lamas, you mentioned the, the, the plasma issue which they seem to have rushed through. And then you have Michael Caputo, who's kind of a conspiracy theorist, who's uh, the chief spokesman of HHS, who's uh, taking a well-deserved leave of absence um, uh, because of some comments that he made uh, about, you know, there being a fifth column of scientists inside the, the CDC that was trying to undermine the president. I mean, what is going on here? And who is in charge and what can be done, if anything? I'll start with you, Dr. Osterholm. Well, thank you. I just have to make one comment on George's uh, answer just now. That was so elegant. I hope that's recorded for posterity. George, that was so comprehensive and so well stated. Thank you. Um, you know, I had the good fortune to work with Tom Clancy a number of years ago, the famous author. Of course, he's now passed on. But uh, one night at dinner, I'll never forget, he said to me, he said, Mike, he said, never forget, there's one really important thing you must remember. The only difference between reality and fiction is that fiction has to make sense. <laughs> right now, I feel like that's the world that we live in, uh, that in fact, I, we couldn't make this up. Uh, yesterday, you saw that it turned out that the NIH had inside its public relations office, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, one of the individuals was actually perpetrated in one of the blog sites that was so anti-government, anti-NIH public health. And he was employed right there in public relations at NIH. I mean, you, you can't make this up. But, and, and as much as we, uh, I might sound like I'm taking light of it, I'm not. This is really a very critical aspect of where we're at. And I think several of the speakers have hit on this about the issue of trust. We have to trust our public health agencies and our government to lead us through this as confusing as it is. And so I think the CDC has all but disqualified itself in the minds of many of the public. And I would love nothing more than to see that change because we need them. Uh, the fact yesterday, it falling on the uh, days after of what was clearly uh, a intervention by the White House yesterday, I believe was just truly a truly an administrative challenge where somebody put up something that wasn't yet signed off on that should have been up there. There are many outstanding people at CDC. We need them. We need them badly. What we need is a leadership to make it possible for them to be involved in the way they can be. And we need people to take accountability when 
problems do occur and not only accept the uh, issue of what happened, but what they're gonna do to change it. And I think that's true at the FDA. Uh, George hit on the issue earlier about challenges about some of the emergency use authorizations and the validity for which they were issued. What does it mean? You know, can we have confidence in future ones going forward? So I think that uh, we have a lesson here that public health is more than just action, it's trust and action. And if you don't trust the action, then the action is not gonna be very successful. And I think that's what we're hitting right now. So I'm right now, I'm no longer going to write factual books, I'm going to fiction, it's easier, <laughs> it's easier. <laughs> And, and I would just like to maybe add to that. I, you know, I think um, it is easy at moments like this to um, doubt uh, these agencies and to really worry about the competency. I worry less about the, the competency. You know, I, I uh, was a career um, CDC employee for you know, several decades, four and a half presidents, et cetera. And, you know, there is a core of career, you know, people who are incredibly competent and trying to do the right thing. I think when you leave agencies to do what they do well, you know, and I would say the same for the FDA and the NIH, who I, you know, work closely with throughout my career, you know, there, there is a core of incredibly gifted, dedicated public servants. And unfortunately, we've seen uh, a situation where the same competent people and agencies have not been allowed to do their job in the best way they can. So I just don't want us to, in this confusion, um, not separate out you know, the competency uh, of those organizations versus a situation that has made it very difficult for them to do what they did, that what they do best. That not standing, there were mistakes made, and you know, George, you you uh, pointed to to some of those, and there were mistakes made. But there will always be mistakes made when we're trying so rapidly to figure out something. But those mistakes will will be most easily and most quickly rectified when organizations are allowed to do what they do well. Can I, can I switch gears here a little bit, which is, you know, there's sort of a puzzle, um, which is why are some countries uh, that with terrible public health systems um, doing surprisingly better than countries like the United States and the United Kingdom with actually pretty good public health systems, you know, where you can trust, you know, globally speaking. Uh, so I'm thinking about, you know, I mean, there, there should be a catastrophe in, in, in countries like Pakistan, maybe it's something underreported, but is there any, you know, we there's been a discussion in the scientific community about BCG vaccines and the extent to which they may have played a role in immunizing populations around uh, the globe in certain countries and, and being a sort of prophylactic uh, to this virus. Uh, does anybody have any thoughts on, on BCG vaccines and where the science stands on that issue? The, as it's referred to, am I on? Yes. Yes. This issue of trained immunity, whether it be with BCG or some other form, allow me license in the term, broad adjuvant-based response, clearly has got some intriguing dimensions to it. Uh, but uh, I, in common with uh, the points that sort of, uh, have been made throughout the panel, that we're dealing with so many moving pieces here and assembling the right type of clinical trials to actually evaluate this. There are several prospective clinical trials now being planned, either underway or being planned, particularly looking at high-risk cohorts in nursing homes to see what effects BCG may be having, having because as you know, the US did not. I have, uh, having grown up in England, I have a fairly substantial scar on my arm from uh, BCG, but I think we also need to look at the fact that there are two major categories of BCG at play here. One is the Japanese uh, strain, uh, and the other is a Danish strain, and the Japanese strain is far more potent in terms of the nature of the immunity. But there are so many black box elements to the 
immune system going back to influenza as a pandemic threat. There is a fascinating concept that originated in the 60s called original antigenic sin, namely does the first strain that you get exposed to uh, uh, in early childhood actually create an immunological imprinting that gives you a superior response to closely related influenza strains uh, and uh, there is at least some circumstantial evidence to that but again these are threads blowing in the wind from which we can't yet create a definitive rope um dr lamas um earlier uh, dr osterholm said this this is something that we'll be living with for years as somebody who's on the front lines as a critical care doctor at brigham young I mean, what does that mean uh, for you as a practitioner, for your colleagues, for the nurses, for the people who work in hospitals? Um, how do you, I mean, reconfigure the system so that it, it kind of allows for the fact that this is not going to go away next year or in 2022 and is kind of just a fact of life that we'll be living with for probably decades? Right. So, I mean, the way it exists right now in Boston, um, where I work, uh, we have here in Massachusetts a fairly, um, uh, you know, low burden of, of coronavirus right now in sort of low transmission rates. And in the hospital, we have um, coronavirus is something that we think of we think about for patients who um, whose symptoms might fit. So everybody in the emergency room is tested for COVID-19 um, if they are going to be admitted to the hospital. Um, we wear surgical masks all the time. We wear N95s for patients for whom we are ruling out coronavirus. Um, so it has become uh, it has become something that we think about um, even as we treat patients for their cancer, even as we you know have ramped up elective surgeries and things have normalized to some degree. Uh, coronavirus is there um, in the background. We have patients who are very sick with it. Uh, we have patients who we think might have it and then ultimately uh, end up testing negative. You know, I think. I think on the sort of human level, um, it, everything still feels in limbo. Uh, we still don't let families come uh, nearly as much as they did before. And that is um, every day, it, that is a, a poignant and, and rather uh, sort of tortured um, issue. Uh, you know, we have patients who, um, if we decide to rule them out for coronavirus, families can't come. Uh, and see them. Why is that? Well, if they're maybe being ruled out, we don't want families to be exposed. These are rules that come from sort of on high in the hospital and things that I think we haven't really worked out quite yet because I think we are still doing a disservice to our patients um, and to their families. So, so you know, as, as we prepare for this not to be transient, as we sort of come uh, to terms with that reality, I do think that we are going to have to, uh, in the hospital, uh, stop being in this sort of early pandemic uh, mindset and start saying, all right, like this is with us. Um, how can we still continue to deliver humane non-pandemic care? And I think that that's something that we, um, we're still struggling with. We're sort of, sort of in the middle between the two and, and we haven't really found our footing and we're going to need to. Because I, I do think and in some ways, though we're giving safe care to people, um, we're, we're, we have, uh, there are some ways in which we're doing our patients a disservice as we're still in this sort of pandemic mindset. A question from okay, Helene. No, and I was I was just going to say. I mean, I think to your point, you know, some of this is we just have to stop resisting it, um, yeah. and and acting as if this is we're going to go back to normal. I mean, I still remember uh, back in the days when you didn't wear gloves to draw blood. You know, <laughs> that was just normal. You didn't, and then uh, you know, with HIV horrible. and everything else. You know, people resisted it at first. Now, you, you know, nobody draws blood without gloves on. So, I mean, I just think that there are things like this that will evolve and, you know, we'll be wearing masks and, you know, it's just normal. Yeah. We, we have a question from Mark Hagerot, who is the Chancellor of the University of North Dakota and is uh, associated with New America. Um, he says, is there any evidence as to how winter affected populations given that the summer, southern hemisphere winter just ended today? What might it say for winter in North America, especially here in North Dakota, which has hard winters? So how does winter play into this? Anybody who wants to jump in? Well, first of all, let me, I just want to say, hey, Mark, uh, a friend and colleague. Uh, uh, first of all, it, it's also important to understand that we came into those preconceived notions that we'd have waves 
of a pandemic uh, unfold because that's what we always plan for with influenza. If you go back and look at the 10 previous influenza pandemics for the last 250 years, two started in the winter, three in the spring, two in the summer, and three in the fall. And every one of them kind of had a first wave, four to six months uh, in length uh, and, and with a trough, and then a second wave. And of course, we've often talked about the second wave, particularly with 1918. Um, we didn't see that with this coronavirus. And uh, in a document we put out in April, we said, you know, how might this look? Might this be waves like influenza for which the first wave ends for reasons we have no idea why? It's not because of the mutation. Even our second wave in 2009 ended before much vaccine was really available. Um, and, and with coronavirus, maybe they're going to be very different. Maybe they're going to just burn constant or burn hot in some areas, even hotter for a temporary period of time. And I think we've all come to the conclusion this is not about waves, even though people use that. Where there is mitigation, you can drive those fires down. We just heard in Boston and Massachusetts, they've done a quite good job. Probably one of the best places in the world is New York State, which went from house on fire in April to a point now where I think there are 40 some days of over 1% positive rate. Uh, it's been remarkable what they've done, while other states in the United States continue. A state like Minnesota, where we're at 23 cases per 100,000 population per day which is six times the rate it is in England right now where they're declaring the need to do shutdowns, okay? So, I mean, it's a relative issue. But I think what we're seeing here is, is that this will just keep transmitting. It's like a coronavirus forest fire. And as long as there's wood to burn, it'll burn. And if we suppress it some, just like a forest fire, you can slow it down, you can hold it down. In some cases, it will miss areas. And then it comes. I mean, if you explain to me uh, what happened in L in California in May and June. I had more people say to me, oh, it's because they don't have public transportation. They don't have a problem. You know, people aren't sharing it. Well, then look what happened in July and August. Uh, everybody has an answer for why some places show up and some don't until it shows up and then it start, you know, it's a real challenge. So I think this thing is just going to go on. I don't think there's any evidence seasons themselves are going to make the difference. I do believe indoor air is very important, as it is in the summertime, by the way, for air conditioning. It also is for heat in the wintertime. But I think you're gonna see transmission of this virus uh, just continue wherever there are people left to get infected and behaviors that result in transmission. You know, it's easy to kind of, obviously there's a lot of um, good reason to be, to be pessimistic about a lot of this, but, for, for each one of you, um, you know, what uh, gives you some hope? I mean, what are the therapies, the vaccines, the public practices, the political leadership, and where, where are you seeing uh, areas where, you know, hope, hope is the possibility? And I'll start with Dr. Lamas. Sure. Um, I would say, you know, here in the hospital, um, we have seen the extent to which uh, sort of good uh, public health uh, mitigation measures can uh, significantly change uh, the face of this disease. You know, we had, I'm, I'm sitting as I told people in a call room and outside me uh, is actually our one of our ICUs. And um, in uh, end of March through April through May up until sort of mid June, um, the hall outside where I am had a coronavirus patient in each uh, intensive care unit room. Um, you know, you walk through, these patients were all prone, they were very sick. Now, um, we, we have one uh, coronavirus patient down, down the hall. Um, the ICU is full of the other diseases that just sort of step back in the setting of COVID. Um, and, and that's hopeful that, that we do have, you know, even without a vaccine, we do have within our sort of armamentarium, we do have the ability to um, decrease uh, the transmission and the prevalence of this disease. You know, I think the other thing that that is can be interpreted as hopeful is you know, the extent to which this disease um, in a way that I have never felt um, does show us uh, how we are all interconnected. You know, I mean, I mean, to me, I felt that in a frightening way at first. You stand in a room and you realize that what this patient has is something that you too can have. But, but there's also uh, something positive about that. You know, in which it forces me, and I hope that as a country we can sort of recognize it. You know, my doing the right thing uh, helps somebody who I will never meet. And, and 
And I think, and I think that there is a power to that, that I, I think, and I think this isn't too much of us from Pollyanna's view, but, but I think that that's something that we feel and see in a way that we haven't before. So I hope that we can recognize that. I hope that that can be something that we take from us. Dr. Post. I think that the, the principal cause for optimism will be on the vaccine front. That's at risk of stating the obvious, but then one has to apply all the caveats that Dr. Gale and colleagues are wrestling with, with regard to uh, how, how do you triage activities. I think that uh, you know, having been the chief science and technology officer for Smith Klein Beecham, now Glaxo Smith Klein, we had the largest vaccine division. One thing I'm very encouraged by is the level of cooperation between companies, large and small, uh, in this effort. Uh, but I think there are still a lot of unanswered questions with regard again to the uh, to the bug immune response. Uh, Mike Osterholm talked about it earlier. What we're going to have to look at is what is the duration of immunity elicited by the current first wave of vaccines. Will we then be back into a situation logistically if you're, if immunity doesn't have a substantial duration? Will we find ourselves back into the need to revaccinate annually or at least uh, relatively frequently? And that has obvious implications not only nationally but globally in trying to immunize seven billion people. The other variable, which at the moment doesn't uh, loom that large, is what is the level of mutational drift in the beast? Uh, we've clearly got a number of strains uh, which are emerging. Uh, interestingly, some might suggest that they have less virulence but uh, equally high contagion, if not higher contagion. Uh, but I think we're going to have to look at that. Clearly, the mutability of uh, SARS-CoV is less than uh, influenza and HIV. So in that sense, there is a, uh, at least some measure of hope, but I think the key issue is going to be vaccines. And then I think the other cause for optimism, which has a sort of a duality to it, is the fact that sadly, if the types of numbers that Mike is talking about, and today we had the University of Washington suggest 400,000 deaths by the end of 2020, will we actually begin to get a sufficient in your face problem? that people will begin to really take this seriously at the societal level. And many of the kind of very effective containment issues that can be achieved just by people exhibiting civic responsibility can in fact uh, uh, at least reduce that. But I think that uh, the key issue is going to reside with the vaccines. And again, very pleased to see corporate uh, cooperation. And uh, at the same time, I think we will be looking at a second and third generation of vaccines. Um, so this has been so, so bad and so awful that, uh, you know, maybe this will teach us some lessons that we needed to learn as a society. Um, and sometimes you need a real wake up call to, uh, you know, kind of as a society think very differently. So, you know, I think that um, one um, we've talked about having a biologic uh, disruption, and we, you know, we all knew that it could come, but until it came, I think people didn't take it seriously. So, you know, one, I think thinking um, much differently about uh, biologic threats as being something that is going to be with us for the foreseeable future and take that seriously and be prepared differently than we were this time. Um, I think, you know, as uh, George was pointing out about the science, I mean, we have done things at lightning speed that we often thought wasn't necessarily possible. The fact that we can in parallel look at vaccine um, phases in a way that has really sped up um, you know, the work around a vaccine and that we're using different kinds of platforms than we've ever used before, like the MR, you know, uh, mRNA um, uh, vaccine vector. You know, I think there's all sorts of new science that's coming out that we would just have um, done in a different way. I do think that this caring about each other is something that um, has happened. And, you know, I think about how we 
used to kind of laugh at Japanese tourists who wore masks uh, and, and thought that that was so quaint. Why would you do that? Uh, you, we were happy to spread our germs to each other. You know, now I think we're thinking very differently about our responsibility to each other and, you know, how we do that. I think that um, the disproportionate impact that this has had, particularly here in this in this country, uh, around in, in black and brown communities specifically. Uh, we all talked about health disparities. We all knew that there was health inequities, but this highlighted it in ways that I think um, has has really shaken people up and hopefully, you know, we'll think about it. And then finally, I just think on the, you know, kind of on the economic and societal side, the fact that, you know, we have been willing to do things to um, bring financial insecurity, um, hold it to the lowest level possible through things like the CARES Act and things that we, you know, the idea of giving cash to people so they could pay their bills was something we were, as a society, we're not willing to talk about. We're now doing things that are helping people in ways that I think could be extended further as we think about how do we make, you know, our country a more equitable uh, country overall. And I think our workplaces are going to be different in the future. And this is also helping us to think differently about work, uh, workplace, um, and some of those sort of things that I think uh, are, are kind of corollaries to the public health aspect of this. So, you know, something this bad, we better learn something from it. We better have some things that make us a better society um, or, you know, this is all for naught. Well, that's a good segue to Dr. Osterholm, who wrote a, a, a great piece in Foreign Affairs, sort of basically outlining kind of what this might mean for a future flu pandemic, or what was that? So, and what your what, what's the headlines from the piece, uh, Dr. Osterholm? Well, I think the key message is that this is not the big one. As bad as this has been, surely we can envision with reality a, a much worse uh, pandemic scenario. Um, you know, influenza will remain the Lion King of infectious diseases today. I believe that to be the case. Uh, the uh, potential for a 1918-like pandemic where the primary uh, uh, morbidity mortality occurs in young, healthy adults at a substantial rate is surely reality. Uh, we have created on this world today the perfect Mother Nature lab for that. Uh, as we speak, there are about 32 billion chickens on the face of the earth. One third of all the birds on the earth today are chickens to feed the protein needs of the 8 billion people. There are 390 million pigs on the face of the earth today to help feed that same 8 billion people. If you wanted to create the most amazing mixing vessel for creating flu strains that will guarantee future flu pandemics, we've done that. Uh, and so I think we have to learn from this pandemic to understand that uh, this was as bad as it is. Not, I wouldn't call it a warm-up. I want to minimize it uh, too much, but it is just a first chapter in what surely will still be an unfolding book of pandemics in this world. So we better learn from this. I, I liken this to a, you know, an old 727 going down here, but instead of having any passengers, it has 4,000. 872 black boxes. We need to examine every one of them uh, so that we really do learn for the future. We got to stop putting out reports, putting them on shelves, and then feel like we've checked that box. We have a lot of lessons to learn. And I think this panel has done a very good job today of elucidating a number of those lessons that we need to learn and apply to the future. You know, a political question um, about the World Health Organization and also uh, about China. Um, I remember the World Health Organization at one point publicly saying that this was going to be sort of like the flu. And it's not clear to me if that was because they were getting Chinese misinformation or they were just misinformed or it was, it was early. But clearly, when the World Health Organization is saying something like this, uh, people take it seriously because they think that the World Health Organization knows what it's talking about. So sort of a two-part question, yeah. one, you know, was the Trump administration right not necessarily to withdraw funding from the World Health Organization, but at least to sort of say that they were, um, you know, getting things wrong. And two, to what extent were uh, the, the Chinese clearly were covering up? The question is, is it just local Wuhan officials who are kind of covering it up? Or was it a wider systematic uh, cover up by the Chinese Communist Party? So anybody who wants to jump in on either of those. Well, I welcome the chance to jump in on this because I find this to be uh, an interesting uh, 
uh, uh, discussion. Uh, you know, we're just a small little center in the middle of flyover land in America, okay? Uh, just a bunch of low college people getting together. And on January 20th, as I said, I put out a statement saying this is going to cause our next pandemic. But we had all the reasons laid out. We had no more access to information than surely our government did. Uh, you know, we had social media. We had some contacts in Wuhan. Uh, we were assessing the uh, situation throughout Asia as we were seeing ongoing spreading transmission. Uh, on February 20th, I wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times saying, let's get on with this. This is a pandemic. We need to change the conversation from the fact that we're going to somehow smother this to we got to get prepared what's coming. You know where I took the most heat from? My public health colleagues who said, why in the hell are you continuing to scare everybody? You just scare people. And it was interesting to the extent to which we all were in denial about what might really be happening because we didn't want to believe something like this could happen. And, you know, I've moved on from that. You know, we're, we're past that now. But I think that uh, there's a part of the human psyche that doesn't want to believe things like this happen. And the first statements are denial. So did the Chinese uh, officials at the Hubei province or Wuhan level try to hide? Absolutely they did. But I don't believe that was a systemic uh, gov Chinese government effort at the time. We surely had enough information. So I always find people who say, well, they were hiding it. Well, then how did we know what was going on, okay? Uh, if it was being hit and so on. Um, the second thing is, I think we're gonna have to help ourselves understand that, uh, you know, this is a challenge. Some of the talking heads today who are out here talking as experts about this pandemic were the very people that were highly critical of our work back in February saying, you're scaring people. The flu is much more important. A major medical journal in late February published a cartoon, a whole page cartoon, showing all the reasons why flu was more important than this particular pathogen was and why we needed to get back and focusing on flu. So I think let's a do over, let's forget about all that other than to say we gotta remember for next time and, and make sure that we don't dismiss this possibility. And I think that's what set us back as a whole. It wasn't just one government, it was a collective mindset I think that set us back. So yeah. could I come in on that? Um, not only building on Mike's typically eloquent remarks, I think that uh, there's a far more systemic issue we have to address here, which is not just the issue of whether the US should or should not withdraw from the WHO, I've got views on that, uh, but nonetheless, it is the fact that what is the actual authority of the WHO to implement the international health regulations and essentially eclipse sovereignty. That's, that's at the core of this debate. And until we actually have a framework in which we actually have a, uh, a supranational agency such as the WHO fully empowered to not only investigate, but to demand transparency and to have site inspection capabilities, uh, we will have this level of obfuscation and lack of transparency. In this case, it happens to be the Chinese, uh, but the, we, we see similar failings go, going back even in recent years, because if you've got a particular component of your economy, which is dependent upon not revealing something, I mean, you could go back uh, to Chile a few years ago, if they had if they had not complied with the uh, IHR in declaring uh, uh, cholera, uh, that they would have taken an enormous economic, well, in fact, they did take an enormous economic hit uh, on, on their food exports. And so we need to look at this and once again as a sort of multi-dimensional issue, but it comes down to uh, funding, uh, the, uh, the authorities vested with supranational agencies, and with, uh, again, apologies for one more deep for diagnostics, we need comprehensive global biosurveillance to address the type of zoonotic uh, genetic assortments that Mike was talking about, where you've got humans, pigs, and poultry mixing on a daily uh, basis. Obviously, we've added to that brew now, not only coronavirus, but there are, there are others, maybe not with pandemic potential, but nonetheless significant economic uh, disruption. And let's not forget that just in the US, we have a $3 trillion agricultural economy which could be equally decimated by an epizootic, whether of natural or nefarious origin. Dr. Gale. 
And I, yeah, I just did. Um, totally agree with both of the previous speakers. I guess I would say, you know, um, WHO um, got some things wrong. We all got some things wrong in the beginning. That's just the nature of, uh, you know, a new, uh, a new threat. And, um, and this is an era where we need more, not less of WHO. We need a, a WHO that is strong and able to do its job um, more effectively. We are not um, going back to the days of, you know, every nation is isolated. We are increasingly a global interconnected uh, world. And we need that kind of uh, an organization that has that global mandate. And, you know, this is the worst time to be pulling back from an organization um, that is, you know, kind of the global public health organization. This is the time where we should be doing everything to support it, to build its strength, to build its capacity, uh, you know, because that's the only way you deal with global uh, pandemics. Cool. I mean, is there an, an analogy to the International Atomic Energy Association, you know, which does do, um, you know, can, can do inspections that are sort of, um, I guess, mandated by uh, by either treaties or the United Nations. I mean, is, is, does, is the World Health Organization it just rely on the goodwill of the countries that uh, that are part of it? Um, you know, it, 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 there is no enforcement mechanism. Is, is that what everybody is saying about the World Health Organization? They can't uh, they they can't come into a country without an invitation. Um, is that the right? Well, imagine the following scenario. We have an outbreak that begins in a major U.S. metropolitan area. I believe that there would be substantial tra you know, transparency, but there could be in the fog of early war of an outbreak, you know, confusion. Now imagine because of that, the Chinese and the Russians insisted on sending the delegation here to investigate because they were concerned about what we were putting out or not putting out. You think for a moment we would suddenly just say, sure, God, send them in, bring WHO over, you guys investigate this. You know, so I, I think that one of the things is also expectation. We have an expectation we can go everywhere, but we also have an expectation that we're all independent by ourselves and, uh, you know, don't say that. So I think the world order has changed too. If you're going to ask for transparency, it really has to be transparent. And I think we'd be as guilty as any country not wanting someone to come in. I think I just want to echo what other people, I didn't mention it in my comments, but I think we need a very strong WHO. It's like we need a strong CDC. This is a time where we really need these organizations. We need to build their capacity. And when they fail, yes, we need to be critical. But we also have to offer our, our ways in which we're going to fix it. And I think that, that uh, right now with WHO, uh, you know, what they're doing with COVAX, the ability to get vaccine to the rest of the world, uh, things like that I think are absolutely remarkable. And uh, I, I want to just go on record saying I hope we're all supporting WHO and what it can and should do. I think another feature in this, Peter, not just for WHO, is the disinformation campaigns. Uh, and irrespective of their origins, whether domestic uh, or international, this is again another significant factor that's insidiously undermining public trust, not only in our agencies, uh, but also in the science. Well, Dr. Gale, that seems like a huge issue on the vaccination front. I mean, when you, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but uh, isn't it like a third of Americans won't even ha take the vaccination, even if it's available? Yeah, and you know, it, it, it kind of divides into three different groups. And so, you know, we have this group of um, people who just don't believe in vaccines, period, don't believe in vaccine science, and, um, you know, they're called the, quote, anti-vaxxers. You know, I think that's a group that is a bit, uh, you know, apart, and, and they will obviously not take this vaccine or any other vaccine. But then I think, you know, we have probably at least two other categories who, because of the confusion, because of a lot of the um, concerns about how decisions are being made, whether they're being made politically or scientifically, there are people who are rightfully skeptical. I, you know, I give as an example, my very closest friend the, from childhood, who was also a physician, 
who is involved in clinical trial work herself, says she's not sure that she believes this and whether she would take a vaccine. So this is not even, you know, you're talking about uneducated people. You know, this is a physician who works on clinical trials who now says, I just don't know if I, you know, trust what's coming out from uh, our, our uh, organizations that are charged with it. And then you also have particularly African-Americans and others who have had historical reasons not to trust who have been used inappropriately in uh, experimentation and have had uh, reasons to have this mistrust. And that's the very population that's being disproportionately impacted, but also has this very long history of uh, you know, mistrust with government, government uh, uh, research, et cetera. So we've got a lot of work to do to repair that trust. And it's going to be an important part of whether or not we get people to take the vaccine. And I think it's a big, huge issue of how do we make sure that we can have the kind of transparency that allows people to actually um, have trust in whatever the product is once it's available. And Peter, on the same score, I think there is the issue of how are we as a society going to react to the inevitable rare or very rare complications that will come from a vaccine. So whether we go back to narcolepsy with uh, influenza, but in the current litigious society, it probably the very rare events are gonna require vaccine, we will not be revealed until we're vaccinating millions of people. But at what point will we then switch on our televisions to see uh, 1-800-BAD-VACCINE uh, as, as the next element in eroding uh, public trust. It's an, an issue that we've got to pay a lot of attention to. Dr. Lamas, you know, a last word from you. Um, you, know, you, you have to deal uh, with the families and, and often families who can't um, even see their, uh, physically touch their loved ones um, when, when they're dying. How, how do you deal with that? Um, you know, how does, how does anyone deal with that? Um, I think we're all sort of, you know, still figuring that out. Um, but I think, I think, um, you know, one, one thing that's important, I'm thinking about somebody, uh, sort of I'm struggling with now, but, uh, you know, I'm thinking, you know, one, one thing that's important is that, is that we want to be able to know that, um, that we're able to tell somebody with certainty that uh, that we've done everything and that um, that and that we have given this person the very best chance to survive and and I think that's when you know we really do uh, need data and I think that and that we you know we people who get this virus we we owe each of our patients the very best care that we can have we owe each of the families that we tell we've done everything to that this is really true that we know that we've done everything and i think that's why you know we do need as we've been saying sort of high quality clinical trials we need to understand um what the course is of this disease even better than we already do you know and i think and i think it's for these families um who often have their own guilt um, perhaps they have been the person who transmitted coronavirus to the loved one who lived with them. Often that's the case and they survived and this other person did not, uh, or other person might not. You know, I think, I think that there's a, a great sense of, of sadness, um, when it seems that this is something that, you know, had they gotten sort of the correct counsel about what to do, um, that this, this could have been something that would have been avoided. And so, so I think that there's a, a great, a great sadness, um, and I think that that's something that, you know, we're all sort of going to carry forward with us kind of forever and hopefully it can sort of fuel us to uh, make real change. Dr. Oesterholm for a brilliant uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.